Um, and and uh, we figured we'd be over at Frank's talk, uh, learning more about uh, all his history and how to type checks and all that fun stuff. So we appreciate everybody taking some time with us to learn a little bit about uh, security management, security leadership. So we'll, uh, Jack and I will dive right in and uh, kind of tell you a little bit about why, why we're here and kind of how we came over this topic to begin with. Um, both of us, we, we talked to a lot of security guys. Um, we, we've been kicking around for a while, and, and we've heard a lot of the same things over and over. That people complaining about the, their inability to solve kind of non-technical problems. We, we saw a lot of themes uh, with different folks we talked to that they're they're running a political barriers in the organization, right? They can't get people to do the things they want to do because they don't report to them. And if they just listen to what they have to say, man, security would be so much easier. Um, and as we started to think about about ourselves, we looked a little bit at leaders we saw outside of security and how are they getting stuff done. And that was really the genesis of this talk, is um, why is security so unique? What are CIOs, CFOs, COOs, all these other people doing that's allowing them to be effective that maybe we can learn a little bit from and, and help us to achieve our own security goals? Um, so that, that's really what we're going to cover in this talk, is um, some of those things we've learned from those leaders that we've spoken with. A um, little bit about me, uh, so I run a consulting practice at a company uh, up on the, up in Cleveland on the west side, uh, been security for, well, IT for about 20 years, security for about 10, and um, you know, used to be very involved in some podcasts, uh, InfoSec Forum, different groups, uh, aspiring Ironman, we'll talk about that a little more later. Jack? Thanks, Chris. Alright, uh, I like to walk around. I don't think you can find on this page. So, uh, I'm really just a humble CISO who's struggling to get the job done every day. I don't have the advantage of being a consultant and just fly with all the answers like Chris. Huh. I'm just trying to do whatever I can to get the job done. And that was really the whole catalyst of the talk for us was, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking around the boardroom, I'm looking around the leadership meetings, I'm seeing what other people are doing, and I'm like, I'm not functioning the same way they are. Maybe I should reevaluate and stop running like IT and start running like another business. So that was why we put this together. So what we did was I took five people that I respected, Chris took five people that we respected, people that are mentors. And it's really important to develop a mental relationship, have someone you can trust, have someone you can kind of refer to down the road when you are, and build that relationship, go to lunch, go to dinner, Develop them, ask them kind of questions that are that you're challenged with, and be vulnerable. That's the key to a good mentorship. Is you have to be vulnerable and tell them where you're weak. If you don't acknowledge where you're weak, they can't help you. So we got stories from all of these folks, and we kind of tallied these stories together, and we found some common themes. And the first one was listening. And sure, everybody tells you, be a good leader, be a good, just a good person. You gotta listen. So when my CEO told me this, I kind of was like, okay, yeah, I'm listening, jotted it down. He's like, no, no, it's not, it's not listening. It's not just a matter of hearing what the person is saying. Are you an empathetic listener? Are, do you have a good emotional intelligence? Do you really have a vested interest in what this person, this person is saying, both personally and professionally? And until you kind of become more of an empathetic listener and develop an interest in that person as a person, now you're actually listening to them because you want them to succeed. You want to help them succeed. And if something personal or professional, because we're all one person, the personal, the, the professional, personal life separation, that doesn't exist. <laughs> so that was what really triggered for me of I don't need to just be a good listener. I really need to be an empathetic listener. I really need to be interested and invested in what this person is saying, and I need to want to help them. And if that doesn't happen, then I'm going to stop my own growth as a leader, and I'm going to be less of a, a good person in general, because this doesn't just apply at work, this applies at home. So a good example of this for me is, I didn't realize it until later, when I was a, a junior sysadmin, I was running an internet service provider. We were owned by a, a bank. 
and it was the middle of the night, it was 9 p.m., and the whole system's down. Everyone's calling in. When the CIO called, and the CIO's like, what, what's going on? The system's down. Like, yeah, I know, I'm struggling. I can't. I'm trying to, you know, answer the phone. I'm trying to bring the system back up. And you could hear that I was just desperate. And he was like, how can I help? And I'm like, well, you know, there's not much you can really do. I'm trying to get the system up. I'm trying to balance this stuff. You know, I'll keep you updated. About half an hour later, he shows up out of the office with some coffee and some donuts. He's like, here's some coffee. I'm going to answer the phones for you so you can focus on the system. And that really inspired me as I was just someone who wanted to see me succeed. Went way out of his, he was a CIO of a big bank, and I'm just this little ISP, a subsidiary of their company. And he could have had anyone in his chain come out and help him. He came out and helped me. It's the middle of the night. And every time we picked up the phone to talk to a user, we couldn't get into their dial-up ISP access. This is back in the early 2000s. He let them tell the whole story of why they were frustrated. He said he was sorry. He said he was doing the best we can. But it was really interesting is I noticed when I would pick up the phone, I would kind of would start with, I'm sorry, this has been down. He would say, What's your problem? And he would like to talk. He would like to vent. And he would listen to them. And he would acknowledge what they were saying. And he would ease their pain. And he also, when he called me, he listened to what I had to say. And he really wanted to help. So he came out and he helped me out. So that was kind of the first thing was listening. And now all of these habits, they're chains. They're, they're, well, they're individual links. Each one can stand on their own. But when they're connected together, they really create a powerful chain. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of share and show how these things all work together. So the first one was listening, empathetic listening with good emotional intelligence. The next is positivity. This is where it starts to kind of give more traction. I mean, we've all been in the meeting where something terrible happens. Get bad news, project fail, lights go down, or I don't know, they're being acquired, or something terrible happens. And if you're in a leadership role, or you're just an individual contributor, and you're sitting around that room with the rest of the people, you have a choice to make. Am I going to provide positive energy to this group, or negative energy, and tap everyone, and make everyone feel even worse? And your first reaction, because you just got kicked into that too. You feel terrible. You're like, oh, this is bad. How are we going to do this? It's over. You've got to kind of take a deep breath. You have to acknowledge it. You have to rationalize why. You have to think, why did this happen? What's the reasoning? Why did leadership decide to do this? Why did this system go down? Why did this project get canceled? You have to kind of take a deep breath, stay silent for a minute. You have to kind of, because you've got to come up in your own mind and understand the why. You have to justify it. You have to know and rationalize it. And then you speak, you have to speak with positive determinality. For where now you have decided that yes, this is bad. But yes, we will move forward. And here's an idea how, I'm not sure if it's the right direction, what does everyone else think? So now what you've done is you've taken this situation in a negative, in a negative room, everyone's upset, you kind of now change the tone of the room, be more positive, and how do we move forward? And now you've got people thinking a little more creatively and you're moving things forward. In IP, and sure, particularly, man, do we love being negative. I love telling people how stupid of an idea that was and how you put the whole company at risk and we should have never done this and this is all bad and we're all going to die and we're going to be on the front page of the papers. It's easy to get negative in IP. It's easy to get negative insecurity. People don't want to follow negative people. People don't want to be part of a negative project. Be positive. Find the why and the intention of what you're trying to do or what leadership is trying to do. <laughs> Convey that in a positive way to get the team to move forward. So first, you want to listen to what's going on and understand it. Then you want to be able to then convey and move the message and the team forward with a positive, in, in a very positive way. Um, the next is know your stakeholders. 
So this one is a, is a personal example. I started in a new company. Uh, the company had several regulatory things. I think we had like five things we needed to do from a regulatory perspective. And I was like, wow, we've got to hit these. I've got, you know, all these different regulatory things. I was really concerned about some PCI stuff. And I brought in Chris. So he's the famous Seagull consultant. He flies in, shits all over everything I'm doing, makes a lot of noise, and flies away. And <laughs> pretty accurate. You know, I'm telling them, look, i got to get this thing. I want to make sure we're getting all PCI compliant. I want to make sure we have all of our written information security program. I want to get all this stuff set up. And he just asks the question, is that really the most important thing you do right now? I'm like, well, absolutely. We want to be compliant. We want to get the compliance. We've got we to we we meet all this stuff. I want to be able to show the internal audit and show leadership and our, our enterprise risk management. We've got this under control. Musical and drastic. Is this the most important thing here? Oh my god, well, of course it is. It's regulatory. It has to be. It's like, well, you, you should really have that conversation. So, I'll go on and ask good advice. So, I went and I started asking. Well, it turns out that uh, in our enterprise risk management, we had some thresholds for, like, you know, what's the likelihood, what's the impact, uh, and what's the value, right? Well, what, what's it going to cost us? And when there's certain money thresholds to where things become a big deal. And if we completely, let's say, lost every credit card we process, we're a manufacturing company, we mainly do business to business, we don't do a lot of credit card business, we get a couple of million years. The fines, the penalties, the impact of the business, was hardly any. I mean, the material impact as far as enterprise risk management is concerned. Now, if we lost these two particular types of intellectual property, oh boy, now we've got a problem. That's a major material impact. If we were to fail the compliance, it would basically be a footnote in the board meeting. If we lost this particular intellectual property, we'd all be looking for new jobs. And uh, it was interesting, the way the CEO explained it, is you really tie it back to the business the impacts of families and the people at the company and why that data particularly is so important. And I thought that was really interesting. I talked to a lot of other people at the company and they mentioned things in a very kind of sterile way, kind of, you know, dollar amounts. We really tied it back to the things of the family of the company. And I started to think, well, maybe I really don't know my stakeholders right. And maybe I don't really understand the drivers of my company, because I'm good. You know, I'm still figuring out the culture. And when I started to look at it in that sterile way of so just impact, likelihood, value, what are the mediating people, you know, presenting it that way, I wasn't getting a lot of traction. I really didn't understand it. But when I started to really understand what the intellectual property meant to the family, and then I could go and have conversations with leadership about that. I realized the compliance stuff wasn't it. He was protecting these couple pieces of intellectual property, and it didn't mean that the, 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 the key thing wasn't how much money we were going to save. It's how many jobs we can save. How many you know lives we would impact if we don't protect this and take this seriously. So there's a, a tool called the Funnel of Pain. It's created by Sandler. It's a sales trick. You'll notice your sales guys will come out and run, run your tool. You call them up and be like, yeah, I need a solution. Well, the solution isn't really why you picked up the phone call. they got to ask you a couple of probing questions to get down to the nugget. And that's what I had to do to understand what my stakeholders really value as a company is. On the surface, I was thinking, well, we want to stay you know, profitable, right? We want to... We want to stay and make sure we meet all of our legal requirements. We want to make sure we protect them on the property. But then when I really started to get down to it, it was, we really want to protect the family. We want to protect the people who work for the company. We want to protect that asset and we and how best to do it. And then you start to make decisions based on that. So taking the time to understand your stakeholders, using this funnel of pain really helped me quite a bit. And it was a big eye-opener. So now I've realized... I don't just try to run forward assuming what people want. I really want to take the time to have a conversation 
I want to listen empathetically. I want to be positive that I can make an impact. And I want to understand what really values to them. So the next one is service. So customer service. I've always thought I was good at customer service. I've been doing IT forever, came up through the help desk, right? So I just take all the calls, work my way all the way up. And I've always felt that, you know, good customer service has helped me kind of get promoted, help me make connections. And I was out to lunch with uh, a lady in our HR department. She was one of the VPs in HR. Great person, really liked her. And she was telling me she had a problem with her PC. And she told me she called into the service desk. She told me who she had. And so what happens with our service desk is you call in, if it gets busy, it'll roll up to like a third tier desk. Well, she got rolled up to one of our third tier desks. And I was like, this is going to be a good story. She got one of the best guys. This is awesome. I'm going to be, I mean, this is going to be a good lunch. And she was like, you know, I told him my problem. He asked if he could load into my machine. He put me on hold. We got back on the phone like two or three minutes later, so the problem was all fixed, so it was good to go, and he said, thank you, you got off the phone. I was like, yeah, you fixed your problem like two, three minutes, way to go, IT. She's like, yeah, I, I didn't really like it. I don't, I'm not confident that you fixed it. You look at it when we get back from lunch, I got the last time I did this weekend, and I want to be sure it's good. I'm like, well, well wait a minute. Well, how, how, what was wrong here? He got, he got on the phone. You got your problem fixed in two to three minutes. You didn't have to do anything. This is awesome. Where where did you go wrong? Well, she was like, well, you know, you didn't ask me really what the problem was. You didn't ask me what was happening. You didn't give me a chance to tell me what was happening. You just put me on hold of control. You didn't tell me what he was doing. You didn't tell me why he was doing it. And you didn't tell me how to follow up on what to do if it happens again. And Wow, I was just sitting there and I was realizing that I'm not good at customer service. And I started to think back through my stories. I'd have people come in with their computer, they'd walk up to me, and I'd have no idea who they were, and then I'd see their computer, and I'd know them. I'm like, wow, I'm a terrible person. I had no idea who you are, but as soon as I saw your machine, I knew you. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, maybe I'm not as good at customer service as I thought. And maybe solving someone's problem doesn't matter as much as how you make them feel. And they're going to remember how you make them feel longer than they're going to remember the problem you solved for them. And I, I really took that lesson apart. And I've shared this now throughout uh, everywhere I've worked. I share this with all the service guys because they sometimes in IT we think how fast and efficient can we solve their problem is good customer service. But if we go back to that first story where my CIO came in, he wasn't to talk. He listened to them. He was empathetic to the problem. They felt heard, they felt understood. And they were happy. They'll forget that we had an outage. But they'll remember that there was somebody at that company that took the time to listen to them, took the time to understand their problem, and empathize with them. So now we can start to see these links becoming a chain. If you don't take the time to listen empathetically, you're not, you don't convey positivity. Because the other problem with this, this, this lady in the was, this guy is one of our best techs. I know he's one of our best techs. She doesn't. So his only way to earn her trust is through communicating. And he didn't convey to her in a positive way that he knows her problem, he knows how to fix her problem, and that he did fix her problem, and here's what to do next time it happens. That now gives her the confidence that he was a good technician and that her machine is going to be good over the weekend. So she can get a report done. And then you're not going to stay home. Even this technician takes the time to really understand what a problem was in her motivation. She didn't know the reason she called was it because the machine was acting racing. So she was really worried about, is it going to work this weekend? She didn't really want her to stay home. Right? So if you're not doing the first four steps 
Are you really going to do good customer service? And are you going to make a Raven fan? So, those are my first five. Four. Four, sorry. Fifth one's pretty good. This one's, this one's good. It's built. I'm building to it. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a moment. I know we only have 40 minutes or so, but I do like it when there's interaction. And that when people get to share their stories and get to share also what's coming, kind of what they're thinking about. Because the reason Chris and I put this talk together, again, was to help everyone kind of get better at the soft skills to move the hard stuff forward, right? Project stuff. The security is a really challenging space. And if anyone has a question or a problem that they're having or a success, please share it with you. Um, because these things are, are, are tough. And these have been hard learned lessons, trust me. So the next one, just say maybe. So this is where they all come in together. Now, now we're here. So this one was a, an interesting story. So I'm your social security guy. Love to say no. Um, I had a, I remember I was on a project meeting the first week in the office, and they were, they wanted to do some really bad things. And I was one leader to tell them how bad those things were. Well, the project manager is luckily a better person than me. And instead of getting mad at me, she decided to go point me. Uh, you know, build a good relationship. She printed out a uh, Dr. No character, Dr. Dean or something, and put it on my white book. And uh, I left the five years ago. I left because I want to always be reminded that you know, Dr. Dean on a project, even as valid as it was, didn't help any help. And uh, a simple example of this is. For all of you, you know, some poor unintending salesperson or marketing person is going to come into your office and ask for Dropbox access, put some new company, you know, non-disclosure or uh, you know, com uh, confidential presentation that you're going to share out with some co company that has a non-disclosure and it's okay, we, you know, we have it, you know, but it's safe, it's in Dropbox. And you're like, oh my God, it's Dropbox, that's the problem. No, and all you want to just do is shout no. Send you that sentence. And it's really hard. But you can take the time to listen to what you're trying to do. You make sure you can get right up front that yes, you can help them. You take the time to understand what their motivations are, why they're trying to do it, what's their intent. Then you can start to collaborate, not compromise. So this was something that came from Chris's CEC item. So like I said, all of these points we got from stories from the interviews. And Chris's CIO made the comment of don't compromise. It doesn't help either party. Both people lose, no one's happy, and you didn't really you didn't really do anything valuable. Instead, you need to come together and collaborate. Because if you're both working towards a common goal, you both understand where you're trying to go. You'll actually develop something that you both like and that better for the company is more valuable. So I really like this point about the we don't want to just say no. We want to say maybe. We want to convey that we're going to do it. We want to understand how they're going to do it. And then you want to open up the dialogue to how can we work together to collaborate for a better solution. So for my Dropbox situation, so I, got, I took the time to really understand what was going on, and this individual actually needs to upload this file every day to a uh, company. And these guys were the big money you get out of the company. And I'm like, yep, Dropbox is working. We can make this happen. There's nothing confidential in it. So from a security standpoint, all right, it's just Dropbox. So I kind of have a model against that. Um, for people with Dropbox, if you don't remember things to today. Um, and, because we took the time and I grabbed some other people from my team, I didn't just try to solve this problem myself. I brought in some other good folks. And what we were able to do is build a secure FTP server, we set up some robocopy scripts, we automated some stuff, and we basically took this task this guy was going to have to do every day 
So we completely automated it, made it secure. And not only that, we now built a new system, and we went out to some of the other groups that we were kind of doing the same thing. And we were like, well, you have this new thing going. We want, you want to do this with your stuff? Oh, now we got something. We would have just said no. We don't do Dropbox. Get out. We are this amazing business opportunity. And there's, there's been so many times in my career where some of the best projects that I've done in IT didn't come from IT. It came from someone in the business who had a simple problem who didn't realize the technology could really just make it so much better. And I love being able to leverage technology to help automate or solve a business problem in a way that they never thought was possible. And that was something that came out of it to say maybe. So I would encourage you guys to think of these, these steps. And it's that take the breath, understand the why, take the time to listen, have a vested interest in helping them succeed. It's not about you. If you help others succeed, all shit drops. It will help you as well. So with that, I'm going to so, I'm going to take everything Jackson laid out, these first five, I'm going to build upon that and take us through the end. So number six, um, anybody who's worked with me, man, this, this is my favorite thing to do. Um, having spent a lot of time in consulting, it's what I'm paid for a lot of time, right? Um, my job is literally sometimes to be the smartest guy in the room. Otherwise, why would you invite me into the room? Um, that's something we do a lot in security, right? Um, I find the same thing in security in general. You probably got there because you were really good at something else, right? You moved up the ranks in IT. Um, maybe you came over from another department outside of IT, but it tends to be that you moved up the chain somehow and got there. Um, because of that background, you're used to your opinion mattering, and you're used to giving it. Um, the challenge is that's only going to get you so far. Um, and the thing that I've learned, and, and what I've heard from a lot of my mentors when I was kind of going through this process, shut your mouth and listen more, right? Um, doesn't matter how smart you are, doesn't matter how great your ideas are, um, can you execute on your idea all by yourself? No, I need all these other people in the room to do this stuff for me. Like, right, well, if you just get in the room and tell them how smart you are and kind of proclaim, they probably don't want to just do it. Right? Um, they really want to be more part of the process of developing the solution. So, uh, this is what I learned with the kind of, don't be the smartest guy in the room. You gotta partner up with everybody else around you. Um, you have to involve them in the process. And there's a really good story I heard from another consultant, um, kind of been handed down through some of my peers over the years. Um, don't know if it's true or not, but it's such a good story I have to share it. The story is about Duncan Hines. So, if anybody's ever made Duncan Hines brownies, you get the little mix in a bag, um, you pour it out in a pan, you drop one egg in there, and you mix everything up, and you throw it in the oven, and you got brownies. And somebody at the Duncan Hines company um, had the brilliant idea, why don't we engineer these things so we've got powdered eggs mixed in with that stuff, right? All you got to do is throw the stuff in a pan, you throw it in the oven, we, you don't have to worry about keeping eggs around, it's going to be so much easier. People are going to love this. And they focus group the thing, and people hated it. And they didn't understand why. And what they found is they started asking people what was the problem with it. When they added the egg to the mix, they felt like they were baking. When they dumped the mix into the pan, they just felt like they dumped mix into a pan. But having the chance to add their egg to the process made them feel more part of the process. And that's part of the idea here, too. Um, Jack hears me say it all the time. Um, you need to give people the opportunity to add their egg. Because either you can let them add their egg into the mix of what you're baking, and it's going to be part of what you come out with, or you bring them, here's my finished brownies, and they're going to throw their eggs all over it anyway. So now you just got brownies with eggs all over it. That's not very good. So it's you got to leave room for their egg. The next one is a, is a good one for us in security, too, um, especially those who came out of technology. Uh, keeping it simple, we, a lot of us are good engineers. Um, we're good at building complex solutions. Again, it's maybe what got us to where we are. Security is a complex problem. Being able to, being able to understand these complex systems 
Um, it makes us good at our jobs, but we can over-engineer. And the, the story of mine I, I like to tell, um, drug vulnerability management, right? So, so coming into an organization, um, I looked around, I'm like, man, I spent all this time consulting. Now I've got to build this in-house. I know what i got to do. First, I need a tool. I need a vulnerability management framework of some sort. I need distributed scanners all over the place so I can scan the DMZ and the core network and on our shop floor. Um, I'm going to have this go every single month and have a rating system and tie it into our change management. And guys are like, yeah, we're not going to prove any of that. you got to copy a message. What? Yeah, yeah that's, that's what you've got. Um, by the way, it's sitting in a corner somewhere on a laptop. Nobody's touched it in three years. Um, yeah, good luck. And so I take a step back. Like, well, all right, so I don't have the budget. I don't have everything I need for my complex solution. And that's what you start thinking about. What's good enough? What am I actually trying to accomplish? Not with my consultant hat on, what's the perfect solution? But uh, what, what's going to get me where I need to be? And as I thought about it, like, well, we're not doing anything for vulnerability management right now. I have a tool. I have a scanner. Um, and as I look around at the other process, all right, we've got a change management process. That's good. I can use that. We've got SharePoint. I can do a little bit with that. I spend some time there. And um, I end up working with our IT team to build a vulnerability management process to glue these little pieces together. It's by no means perfect in any way, shape, or form. But it got results. We all agreed. All the stuff that they were coming to me with Hey, do you know about the latest patches for this thing over here? Our vendor's telling us about that. We funneled them on to a SharePoint site. We all agree on the ratings. That got funneled into their change management. Um, all by hand and only on the most important stuff. Um, I didn't have all the automation that I wanted, but what I had was a proof of concept that now that I made my case so I could go ask for budget for all the other things I thought were so great. I couldn't build a complex solution out of the gate and we didn't want to fund it. Something else I like to talk about is, is execution. So something we, we've seen a lot with security guys, uh, the security guys and gals, uh, we, we're very good at pointing the finger. Right? So um, there, if, if, the IT, if the system admins, the network admins, if HR, if they would just not do these stupid things, right? If HR would stop sending personal information out in unencrypted email, Man, my security problems would be solved. If the system admin could just patch their system, man, our security problems would be solved. But they're not, and it's not my fault. I'm just pointing out the problem. Um, and then when we finally do get approval sometimes to go forward on the projects that we whined about for a couple of years, um, I think we're almost surprised that we finally get to go ahead. We're so used to being the finger pointers that we'll stumble a little bit, right? Because we're not used to having to actually pack up the words. Um, and, and I think it's really important to really go the opposite direction. Um, you are going to often be in a position of pointing out problems, hopefully diplomatically, but pointing out issues that other groups have to deal with, and you're going to get buy-in to doing something about the eventually. When that happens, you have to execute your ass off. You can't do it halfway. You cannot let anybody else be an excuse. Oh, well, this group's not holding up their end. No, you're accountable for it. You've got approval for the project. You're trying to push it forward. You need to take that leadership role. You need to make sure it's a tax management program. It's happening. It's system admin, other reason it's not. It's security awareness. It's training department. It's not the reason why your project isn't done. It's your job to get it done. You need to make it happen. And I just think it's so, so important not to point that finger. Um, the other thing I like to talk about too is is metrics in this space. So when I talk about execution, you can't shoot from the hip either. You need to have some sort of a plan. Right? I'm an ISO guy. I like following that process. But however you do it, have a plan. Have a project plan. Have a security plan. And have some kind of metrics of how you're going to measure that we are moving along the way, that we're getting better. Because you don't want to be in that position of getting to the end and saying, I think we did good. How do you know? Because I think it's better than before. Why? Because I bought a new tool and it's running. So how much better is our security? Better. You need to be able to have something better than that when you're talking to guys who are signing the checks. So, how about I love the vision during this execution? So, 
So Chris and I wrote this about a year ago. Um, it took us some time to get some more deep support. And we've talked a lot about this as a team It's started to become a bit of a different meeting to this. In the first, we were like, take action, get the job done. And we started to see it's actually more about ownership. Taking the ownership in the good and the bad, right? And really stepping up. And like you said, sometimes when it's security and IT, we have to rely on others to sometimes take action for us and to be powerful. And it's easy to find a dog. I think at that time it's not that far we're behind. It's good that metrics to know what you're behind. But it's that ownership. We need to take extreme ownership of everything in that space, the good, the bad, and we want to build a really sharp product. And, and that's really where I think it's starting to change. We, well, Chris was out of the car, so I had a, and a, a question they asked is, but obvious, how many people think the CEO should be held personally liable for a favor? Well, how, how many think the CEO should go to jail if you have a data breach? Everybody's hand shoots up, right? Of course, as a security guy, I think if the CEO screws up, um, or I say, I, I, we have a security breach, I think the CEO should go to jail, absolutely. And nobody in that room looked at themselves and said, I think I should go to jail, right? Well, they're responsible for security. Make your case for how the CEO might have been negligent or not. But that, that, that's a little bit of a gap that, that I felt like I saw was that you need to be holding yourselves accountable. You may or may not be an officer of the company. You may not be personally liable. But you need to look at it that way. I, I doesn't hold a lot of water, I think, to point the fingers elsewhere. You need their help. You need their buy-in. But it's your job to get their buy-in. It's your job to communicate that risk. And I think we've, for so long, been in that, that kind of finger point. Um, we need to look a little bit of ourselves and hold ourselves accountable. For, yes, we own security. We're not going to get every last little thing we want every time, but it's our job to manage that risk and communicate it upwards as best as we can. Just like legal, just like food safety if you have that, just like your quality group, just like enterprise risk. And it's good, we got five minutes left. Uh, walk the talk. So another one security guys we're, we're, we're good for is um, do as I say, not as I do, right? Nobody gets local admin rights anywhere, but please, I need domain admin. Why? Because I'm a security person, right? Of course I need to have that. Um, this this probably, as, you, as I say it, it seems obvious, but none of us tend to, to do it in practice because it's so easy, right? Just give me the rights, give me access. I think it's hugely important to try to flip that equation too, right? If you're going to tell people that they're not going to have admin rights, you should be the first one to get yours taken away, right? I don't need them. I've got people whose job it is to run the system. I've got domain admins. I've got network admins. Let them do their jobs. What access do I really need? Where can I work through them? And what do I really need that's special? Um, that's something that I've done in the past where by following that process, when I circle back six months later to people who were so against the idea, I had a little bit more of a moral high ground because they knew I'd suffered a little bit not having some of the rights they'd had. So when we started to clamp things down a little bit, it was a lot easier than if I just said, hey, you know what, I need them, but you don't. You know, it, it's important to really, again, hold yourself accountable and kind of lead by example. The, um, the last one I want is self-reflection. So it sounds very kind of new agey, and, and why is this in here? Uh, it ties all the other ones together. You, you've heard me say a couple of times about looking inward, and, and for all these things, so, so much of it is about that, right? It's very easy to point the, so that thing you're blind, so to look at the people around you and look at the things they could be doing better. Um, but one of the things that really resonated with me was another security leader another company. Um, he pointed out that the only person he's really got control over is himself, right? You can change your own behavior. You can't change everybody else's. And by changing your own, you can impact those around you much more effectively. By complaining about their behavior, you're really just causing yourself unnecessary heartburn. So that that's why we put this in here, is this idea of you really, and, and you may come up with your own version of these and habits. This is what we've built with our people. Um, have something like this that you look at on a regular basis, that you feel are the direction you should be going. And take a look at that and 
are you actually following that? Because I will tell you, I, I look at these ten every so often, and I go, you know, I could, do, I could be doing better. Um, have mentors outside your organization, inside your organization, and meet with them. And ask them the same question. How am I doing? Where could I be better? Here's the things I said I was going to work on. How do you think I could improve? I mean, it's all this self-improvement stuff, right? In the face of it, what does this have to do with security? But by doing that, you're going to be a much stronger leader. By being a stronger leader, you're going to be able to get a lot more done in security, regardless of where you are in the food chain, because there's nobody in this room who's not in a position of trying to influence people around them who don't necessarily report to them. So there's a, a good book. It's uh, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, written by Marshall Goldstein. Uh, it's a great book. I actually implemented it this year. I did a 360 survey for uh, about 20 people in my organization, people below me, laterally, above me, customers, and put all that data together to really get an outside view of myself. And the, one of the things that you know, he writes about is Peter Drucker, he's a famous manager, uh, a professor at one point. And uh, he said the difference between a good leader and a great leader is not what they're doing, it's what they need to learn to stop doing. And through self reflection, knowing yourself, and being vulnerable, and opening yourself up to others to ask, how are you really doing? A certain couple of certain things, and picking one of those things and really focusing on it is really what can take you from a good leader to a great leader. And we would like to ask everyone in this room, and we only have a few minutes left. These events are great. Chris and I have been going to security events for over ten years, and the best part about these events, not the talks or forget the talks, it's the people you meet. It's hallway talk, right? Please take a moment. Introduce yourself to some of the people at the table. Make a connection today. Meet someone new. And yep, it's easy to make that connection. You know what's harder? It's come Monday, you go back to the office, send them an email. Complete the connection. Stay in touch. All your companies are unique flowers, but I'll tell you what, they all have the exact same problems. <laughs> I've never worked anywhere that doesn't have the same problems in security. Share your problems. Be vulnerable. Tell people where you have your weaknesses. And be confident. Tell people where you've had accomplishments. Because they probably can hear that you've had, they probably use that advice too. So, the biggest thing to take away from our talk is make a connection, get a mentor, reflect on yourself, not only become a better leader at work, become a better person. You know, find that it helps you everything you need. Anyone have any questions or comments? Anything you'd like to share? Take a couple minutes. Come on. Nobody? Was it at least was it a good talk? Was it inspirational? Did you guys feel you get something done? <laughs> Alright. Good. So hopefully it just move forward and make some progress. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.